Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this webinar brought to you by BDO. Uh, my name is Tony Young. I'm a partner in the Business Services Division of the firm, and I'm joined today by our senior tax partner. And so um, thank you for joining us, Mark. Welcome. Thank um, you. There's a couple of photos there, obviously old photos, because we're smiling. Um, but Mark, the theme this afternoon we've been given is clarity for business success. Um, so I'm not sure that whether they're being ironic or it's an aspirational title, given that we're talking about the vagaries of tax. So today we're going to review uh, the tax landscape in the aftermath of the federal election, uh, look at what's in and what's out, discuss what that means for business in terms of potential changes and whether the returned government will have an easier time of things um, in terms of getting legislation passed through the Senate. We've also had a state budget uh, here in Queensland um, passed by the Palaszczuk government, which ha will have some impact on any businesses that have land holdings here, and we'll talk about that a bit later. And finally, we'll have some general discussion around what we're seeing in the current business environment in terms of their dealings with our friends at the tax office. So Mark, the last time we gathered around this microphone, it was before the federal election. Um, and at that time, there was a high expectation that uh, Labor would win. Uh, and as a result, we were contemplating some significant changes in the area of taxation. Um, I won't say reform, um, because reform implies some considered systematic cohesive approach, um, but there was significant uh, changes contemplated. Uh, there was contemplation of uh, the different tax rate regime, which we'll be talking about today, a reduction in the capital gains tax discount changes to the ability to, to contribute to superannuation and uh, a, a number of other miscellaneous changes, including the horrendous $3,000 limit on the deductibility of fees for managing tax affairs. So May 18 came and went um, and the polls and pundits were all uh, wrong. So death and taxes are certain, but election results aren't. In some respects, a lot has happened since we last spoke, but very little has changed. So to paraphrase our Prime Minister, how good is tax, Mark? Tax is, tax is great, Tony. Tax, tax is wonderful. Uh, we just have a, 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 fe a federal income tax system, at least, that has gone 15 years without any significant reform. So we're a little bit, um, a little bit on edge to see what happens over the coming, coming 12 months. So the reform that we've seen from the uh, return government is in the form of tax cuts. Um, there hasn't, there's, there's been a lot of uh, sound and fury of about $1,080 low and middle income tax offset, which has been, uh, which, which was passed eventually on the 4th of July, just in time for everybody to uh, lodge their returns through, through MyGov and, and try and get their refund as fast as possible. Um, now, clearly, Oh, $1,080 um, potential refund for people earning up to about $120,000 uh, is probably not the big ticket tax reform that the business community is really looking for. Uh, but you never know, it may help um, certainly with economic conditions apparently being a little bit difficult, particularly for retailers. Uh, as those $1,000 refunds drop into people's bank accounts, uh, there may be some propensity to spend them, uh, which may, ju may just help a little bit around the edges. One of the things that was a little unusual was that this was in effect from the 1st of July 2018. Although that offset was only ever going to be delivered once tax returns were lodged for the 29th, the year ended 30 June 2019. So the whilst again there was a fair bit of sound and fury about the passage of those of those tax cuts and quite correctly there was a, a lot of discussion about the level of certainty that the government could provide around those tax cuts uh, at the end of the day, the fact they were passed on the 4th of July 2019 hasn't really affected the payment of those refunds to anyone. And the sound and fury that you referred to was around the argy-bargy that the uh, opposition were trying to, to do in terms of dealing with future tax cuts? That's right. So the, the, the the tax cuts, or well, the individual tax cuts measures that went through on the 4th of July also include some changes um, in the out, in some outer years. So from the 
2023 so from the 1st of July 2022 there is some uh, increase in the in the thresholds at which certain tax rates will will be applied and then from the 2025 year so from the 1st of July 2024 there is a fairly significant change where one of the one of the tax bands disappears entirely and so you end up with what is effectively a four a four band system rather than a five band system uh, and that for someone on the top marginal rate of tax is potentially worth eleven thousand odd dollars in the twenty twenty five year. Are those those constituents previously referred to the big end of town, Mark? Uh, Tony, you and I have had lots of discussions in in these webinars and and offline in relation to exactly where the big end of town is and how we catch the bus there. Uh, I'm not entirely sure that anyone uh, has managed to identify properly what. The, the target of some of these measures is, and that's really the problem that we're having with tax reform in this country. We have a whole lot of single issue thought bubble proposals that aren't really part of a holistic discussion about what we want to tax and how much we want to tax it. It seems to be driven by what's uh, politically palatable for a particular party. Of course. All, all life is politics, Tony. But, but yes, a, a, absolutely. There is a, an, and unfortunately, if there's if there's an unfortunately out of the election result, it means that all major parties are going to be very wary of going to an election with anything like a well-developed policy, um, because it's just been demonstrated again, as it was with John Hewson in 1992. Oh, 1993. Sorry, that uh, going going in with a well-developed policy is a is a big red flag, saying shoot holes in this for me, please. Um, very, very hard to achieve. Very. And all of Gloucester and the media attention around the argy bargy on those uh, acceptance of those changes seems to be a bit futile, given that uh, these things can be changed in, in an instant, either by a change of government or even by a change of, of economic circumstance. So next budget, we could have a, a reversal. Correct. Uh, and and there, there, is, uh, there is history for that. There, you, you're, you were probably old enough to remember, Tony, the LAW law tax cuts that uh, a certain Prime Minister Keating um, referred to, which, eventually, which never really eventuated. So yes, I mean, legislation could be passed. Legislation can also be repealed by the same process. That will be repealing legislation in an Australian context is more difficult because of the, the way that the Senate operates and that the Senate, most of the time, the Senate only ever is half replaced at an election. Um, however, absolutely, I, I wouldn't yet be putting my house on the fact that the tax cuts in the 2025 year are actually going to get here. That's a, that's a long way into the future yet. And before we leave personal income tax rates, I know that the government's website says this is lower taxes for hard working Australians. I know that ATO have significant data matching uh, capability, but does that mean that they're able to determine those taxpayers who aren't working that hard? <laughs> um, it may, maybe that, that data needs to be shared with those employees, employers perhaps. Um, it, the, the tax office does have significant data matching capability, you're right. Uh, it's almost coming to the point where the tax office knows more about your tax affairs than you do a lot of the time. Uh, the, the amount of data that's becoming available through pre-fill, the online reporting to the tax office is expanding every year. Um, so there are certainly uh, messages there for, for ordinary taxpayers. Tony, to use another one of our, fa our favourite favorite words where there's no definition, ordinary taxpayers are almost in the position where the tax office could just about do their tax return for them. And in fact, that is where the system is going. I'm sure some taxpayers would resent the term ordinary. Uh, yes. So continue on the theme of tax rates. Uh, again, an issue which has been um, quite political, uh, corporate tax rates and then frank and the franking credits. Yes. So um, the, 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 corp the corporate Corporate tax rates um, are cut. We currently have a two rate system for, for corporates in Australia. We have a 30% tax rate, which is the general corporate tax rate, but we have a, a lower rate, 27.5% for uh, what, what, what are described as small business entities, um, but those small business entities can have a turnover of up to $50 million. So there's, there's some fairly significant small business entities in, captured by that. 
So at the moment, the tax rate for those small business entities turning over less than $50 million is 27.5%. But this is the last year of the 27.5% tax rate. So next year, from the 1st of July 2020, uh, the, corp the lower corporate tax rate drops to 26%, and then the year after to 25%. Now, there is currently no legislation before Parliament to change the corporate tax rate from 30% for larger taxpayers, so for larger companies turning over more than $50 million, the rate remains 30%. The issue in all of this is, in a sense, not so much the corporate tax rate though. The issue in all of this is the, actually the franking rate, particularly where we're talking about um, private companies who are paying out dividends to their to their shareholders. So the way that the system works, the franking rate that you can apply to a dividend, which is the um, credit for the underlying corporate tax paid, is not related to the rate of tax that you actually paid on your retained profits. It's related to the rate of tax that you are going to pay in the current year on the profits that you make this year. So. Um, for example, if in a couple of years' time, in the 2022 financial year, if we've got a company that's turning over less than $50 million, they'll only be able to attach 25% franking credits, 20, 25 cent in the dollar franking credits, irrespective of when those profits were earned and whether in fact the tax that was paid was 27.5% or 30%. That's a very long-winded way of saying that it's likely that a number of companies are going to end up with wasted franking credits, franking credits that they can't actually attach to dividends paid out of retained profits because their franking rate is going to be less than the rate at which they paid tax on those profits. So in, in a sense, it, now is the time to be thinking about that because even if we're a small business entity, we're under $50 million turnover, we're currently paying tax at 27.5%. We might want to think about whether we actually pay dividends perhaps in excess of what we otherwise might in order to clear out our franking credits at 27.5% so that the, the, the benefit, the 1.5 or 2.5% difference between the corporate tax rate now and the potential future franking rate um, doesn't get lost, doesn't get, doesn't, it, it never gets lost, it's retained in the company but the company can't actually do anything with those franking credits. Um, so it's, it's, it's a worthwhile conversation to be having and something that needs to be monitored in relation to larger businesses as well, because I don't think the current government has completely walked away from its proposal to reduce the overall, the general company tax rate for companies with a turnover of more than $50 million as well. Now, I think they'll have some trouble in the Senate with that, but who knows? There's some general, there's general there's different schools of thought as to the benefits of lowering the corporate tax rate and we've seen, we've seen the US do it it's, and it's, it's perceived to be stimulatory. I think there's some misunderstandings out in the general population in that again that's that seem to be giving a tax break to the big end of town but in reality corporations they just pay less tax, they've got more funds available, arguably they'll spend more on on, on investment and, and employment so that's seen to be stimulatory. Um, so and, 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 and to an extent even if they don't spend the funds on investment and employment, um, there are two other options. They can either retain it as cash, which has no stimulatory effect at all, or they pay it as dividends. Now, if we assume that the, the individual tax rates remain constant, if they pay it as dividends, then the, the tax eventually gets paid um, at, at the relevant individual marginal rate. So there is some benefit either way, whether it's spent on investment or just returned to shareholders, the, the economy or the government, depending on which way you want to look at that, will benefit from, from the lowered corporate tax rate. And this process for dealing with franking credits is a departure from the previous system where we had changes of tax rates. Do you, do you, know, do you know why they, they changed? Oh, simplification, Tony. Simplification. This, this was to make it simpler. So, so in the for old... For listeners out there, that's, that's an ironic statement from Mark, Mark Milesworth. <laughs> um, I, I, you, you were commenting on my level of sarcasm earlier. Um, it, look, the, it, under the old rules, you used to have different classes of franking credits. Those rules are, are long gone. They, they haven't existed since the early 2000s. Um, these days, you have a maximum franking rate, which is related to the rate of tax that you're going to pay in the current year, and that's it. 
in theory, that's a simpler system. Whether it's a fairer system or not is, is a different question. Well, I would suggest it's not because you're going to have taxpayers who are going to lose franking credits and potentially not have a capacity to get them back. Oh, that's absolutely right. And that is absolutely what will happen. Um, Treasury, so the Department of Treasury, the government would say, well, that's a, that's a design feature of the system that some franking credits will be wasted. Um, and that's just good for the government. Congratulations. Moving on from tax rates then, super guarantee charge. Yes, look, the super guarantee charge, you would think for a system that's been around since 1992, 1993, um, would be well bedded down and, and operating well. Um, but the evidence seems to indicate that not so much. Uh, the, the super guarantee gap is, which is the difference between what the government thinks should be paid in superannuation guarantee and what is actually paid, is in the orders of billions of dollars a year. And so that's billions of dollars a year not going into people's superannuation funds. Uh, the government is clearly concerned about that. Um, so there's, there's a few things that have happened in relation to superannuation guarantee that that I think our, our clients and our, our, our listeners need to be need to be wary of. Um, the first is that the tax office. We we are seeing evidence the tax office is very much ramping up its superannuation guarantee compliance program. Uh, so previously we were usually only seeing superannuation guarantee inquiries which came from uh, complaints by employees to, to the tax office that they hadn't been paid their superannuation. Um, we're now seeing the tax office commencing superannuation uh, guarantee reviews off their own bat and the tax office is being placed in a very um, in a very powerful position to do that because of the advent of um, contributions reporting from superannuation funds and single touch payroll, which also reports superannuation that should be paid by an employer in respect of each employee every time that a pay run is done. And so it's a fairly easy uh, process and a fairly real time process for the tax office to say, well, under single touch payroll, this employer is saying, that they should have paid Tony Young $1,000 in super, but the superannuation funds are reporting that Tony's super accounts have only received $250 in super. Where's the $750 difference? And, and that's a very easy job for the tax office to send out a letter saying, hi, we've noticed this difference. Now you better go back and reconcile your superannuation guarantee for the last four years on an employee by employee, quarter by quarter basis, and come back to us and report, report that to us. So we are seeing a lot of activity from the tax office, and I think we will eventually see a lot more um, around superannuation guarantee. The other thing that's happened is the government, because of this superannuation guarantee gap that they're, they're perceiving, has passed new legislation to give the tax office even more power um, to, make, to do things like uh, make directions to employers to immediately pay superannuation guarantee, which then becomes an offence if you don't comply with that direction. So at the moment, not, play, not paying superannuation guarantee is, is absolutely a naughty thing to do. You get penalised for that, but it's not actually an offence. Now, if the tax office notices that you have an underpayment, directs you to make that payment good, and you don't, um, then that's an offence and you, you, you could suffer prosecution for that. That's on top of all the rules that have been in existence for several years where a superannuation guarantee debt can now, um, or is able to be passed on to the directors of that company. So you can't rely on the limited liability of a company to save the directors from having to make good the company's superannuation guarantee debt. That's a big change uh, in terms of exposure. In terms of exposure, yeah, well, it's a, signi it's a significant exposure, which I think a lot of directors aren't necessarily aware of. The provisions have been there for several years, but um, I think a lot of directors are not aware that as soon as the company fails to make its superannuation guarantee payments when it should, they are automatically personally liable. Now, before the tax office can take action to recover that, they've got to write to you and tell you and give you 28 days to fix it. Um, but you are immediately personally liable if you if your company that you're a director of fails to make the payment. And that also applies to newly appointed directors. So once you're appointed as a director, if the company has a pre-existing superannuation guarantee liability, you're appointed as a director. 
30 days later, you'll be personally liable. So doing your due diligence on directorships and, and accepting directorships is vitally important. The other issue with the super guarantee is that if you do, as you referred to, if someone makes a small error, the compliance requirements around demonstrating to the ATO that you've complied are, are huge. If you've got a number of employees who are on different awards, you've got to go back four years, you demonstrate every, every period, uh, but corresponding to the actual shortfall, uh, the cost of, of, of dealing with that is, is, is massive. Correct. So so it's, it's a per employee, per per quarter analysis that you've got to do. And although I said, you know, although I said, you know, the tax office normally starts by saying reconcile the last four years, there's actually no limitation period on super guarantee debts. So you know, the, the tax office can potentially ask you to go back as far as, as far as possible. Um, the other thing that we've seen is that people, you know, superannuation guarantee per employee is a number that pops out at the end of the, of the payroll system. Um, we've seen a number of cases recently where the payroll system the coding of the different pay types hasn't been correct. And so we have been paying super on some things that perhaps we shouldn't have been paying super on, or worse, we haven't been paying super on some pay lines that should have had superannuation applied to them. And that sort of systemic error, when you then multiply that through the system becomes a very large problem very quickly. Next item is the extension of director penalties to, for GST purposes. Yes, so we're talking about director penalty notices in respect of superannuation guarantee. Um, that's been in place for a number of years. Um, directors can also also be made personally liable for unpaid pay-as-you-go withholding, so the withholding from wages. Um, that's been in place for, for decades. But from the 1st of July this year, so only 18 days ago, um, directors can now be made personally liable for unpaid GST debts. Now, you, now you might say, well, that's not much of a difference, you know, it's all the same. It's an interesting development though, because it's the first time that um, directors have been able to be made personally li liable for um, a tax debt of the company itself, simply because the company hasn't paid it. Now, superannuation guarantee, that's someone else's money. Pay as you go withholding, that's been withheld from someone else's wages. So you could see the policy rationale as to why directors need to be very careful about those things. That effectively, they're, they're, they're denying someone else their proper remuneration. Extending that to GST really extends the, um, the, 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 the policy behind these director penalty notices um, to a whole different level because generally, you know, Tony, when we're talking to people about, well, what, what structure should I operate my business through? We say, well, you know, company's good, limitation of liability. It means you, you try really hard as long as you don't trade while insolvent. Um, you know, the, the company's liabilities are the company's liabilities and they're not visited in the ordinary course of events on the shareholders or the directors. Um, the director penalty notices pierces straight through that protection. And in this case, that's in respect of GST, which is a tax liability of the company itself. It's not someone else's money, it's the company's liability. So um, it, it's an interesting extension. If if it goes well for the for the government, for the tax office, making directors personally liable for GST, my question is, well, how long, how long is it before that becomes all tax liabilities, FBT, income tax, and so forth. But the important point for right now, for July 2019, is um, directors are personally liable if their um, if their company, of which they're a director, doesn't pay their GST on time, it would seem to me that that will get some changes in behaviour, and it, and it's very likely they'll be extended, as you suggest. Well, you, that's the idea. The idea is to change behaviour. Uh, the problem is this hasn't been well publicised. Then there's you know we we see plenty of those um, Game of Thrones style advertisements about making multinationals pay their fair share of tax. But in respect of things like this single touch payroll, there's been no public advertising. Um, and these are significant changes to the obligations of players in the tax system. We're seeing nothing, no communication. I'm sure we'll see it in the media when there's a few scalps uh, as a result of this. I think that's right. So before we leave this area, we might just go back to, you mentioned the backlog of, of tax uh, legislation, which hasn't gone through. And we've seen a, a change in the Senate makeup uh, from, it's a little bit surprising in some respects, uh, from, from what we had previously, which 
potentially gives the government a little more latitude or ability to get things changed. I think we've got 36, 35, and they need four to get legislation passed. They do, and you would have to think one of those is, is Senator Bernardi, um, who, who historically has voted with the government on, on most things, so that then leaves them three out of five. Um, so it becomes, a, I think, a much easier negotiation because those five other senators are Senator Lambie from, from Tasmania, who's, a, who's an independent, two Centre Alliance senators, and two Pauline Hanson One Nation Party senators. So in reality, um, Senator Cormann's job which, which it seems to be negotiating with the crossbench, suddenly becomes a lot more confined because he needs three out of those five. In essence, he's doing two negotiations, one with Senator Lambie and then one with whichever of the other two parties he thinks is more likely to support the particular measure. Um, so I think the, the negotiation process becomes more confined, potentially faster. Um, but to do that, the government needs to introduce all this tax legislation and we have seen nothing other than the personal tax cuts. Well, to do that, they'll need to sit, and they've only sat for four days, as I understand it, so far this. They have. They'll, 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 be, they'll be back either later this month or early in August, so we'll see what happens then. Thank you. Moving on. What you need to know. Is this all I need to know? Oh, Tony, 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 the number of things that you need to know. Uh, I, I think we've only, we've only got another half hour. We'll see how we go. Um, certainly, you, you wanted me to talk about significant global entities, um, and I thought I'd touch on this. A significant global entity for Australian tax purposes is an Australian entity whose global group has a turnover of a billion dollars or more. And so you sort of think, oh, well, you know, how many people could that possibly affect? But we're seeing lots of, lots and lots of uh, tiny little companies operating in Australia, which are subsidiaries of multinational groups and when you actually add up the global turnover you get to a billion Australian dollars remarkably quickly and so there's a remarkable number of these entities that we're we're seeing floating around they don't have to be foreign owned so we have a number of significant global entities just in this office who operate only in Australia but they have more than a billion dollars turnover and so they are also significant global entities the significance of that is twofold. One is that significant global entities have quite um, extensive disclosure obligations. They have to lodge more things. They've got to do things like country by country reporting, which when you say it quickly sounds easy, but is actually a whole lot of documents and a whole lot of work that needs to be done um, in order to lodge. They have to lodge general purpose financial statements. So you know, a, a, a small Australian entity which is which has a global parent um, previously probably got away with lodging special purpose financial statements now they've got to lodge general purpose financial statements in order to comply with the tax law not to comply with the corporations act but to comply with the tax law and probably the thing that we're seeing with significant global entities more and more is that if you fail to do any of that or indeed if the significant global entity fails to lodge a business activity statement on time or lodge any document which is required by the tax office on time, they're subject to penalties of $105,000 a month. So up to a maximum of five months, so up to a maximum of $525,000 per document lodged late. Room so we didn't hear all the screams out there. Uh, that's extraordinary, isn't it? It is. And look, I've uh, had personal experience in the last three weeks where uh, a client that was a significant global entity lodged a couple of business activity statements 15 days late, so two of them, um, uh, and was hit with, threatened with 200 odd thousand dollar penalties. Now, we have the ability to try and get them remitted and win the process of negotiating that, but boy, there's a lot of, uh, a, 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 lot of, a lot of tension in the room when you're talking about 200 odd thousand dollars in penalties and well, we're now gonna to have to throw ourselves on the commissioner's mercy to try and get him to re reduce or remove that entirely. It's not a conversation you wanna be having. And you can understand the, the intention of, of insisting on compliance for these things, but the penalty levels just seem totally disproportionate to the potential mischief of not lodging a bass or another form here or there. The punishment doesn't fit the crime, does it? It, it would seem to me that th that sort of penalty level is appropriate 
for significant global entities who are thumbing their nose at the Australian tax system and just failing to lodge. And indeed, you could make a case that that's the appropriate level of penalty for wholly domestic businesses that don't have a billion dollars in turnover who are thumbing their nose at the tax system and just not lodging documents at all. But we're talking about applying those penalties because well, for whatever reason, don't, this doesn't relate back to the client I was talking about previously, but you know, where the financial controller is in hospital for a couple of weeks and suddenly the, the, lodgement, the lodgement's late, um, that's a pretty harsh uh, situation to start from. And I guess we've seen where it's one thing to have these potential penalties, but we're actually seeing a lot of these penalty notices being issued around the country. Yes, correct, correct. So uh, I think the, the message is understand whether you're a significant global entity or not. And if you are, understand what your obligations are, because failing to meet them is becoming a very large issue. I think it's a bit of a sleeper for a lot of people who haven't really understood their obligations here. And, and as you say, the, the costs of compliance, just, just apart from lodging your normal returns, but going to the uh, issue with changing your financial statements and so forth, it, it can be quite material. Absolutely. And if you don't plan for it and you're trying to do it at the last minute, it becomes massively time consuming as well. And a discussion about tax wouldn't be the same if we didn't reflect on Division 7A. It's one of our favourites, Mark. Yes, Tony. New, new, new rules have been kicked down the road uh, one more time. You can hear that coke can clanging as it goes. Rattling away to the 1st of July 2020. Um, I wish I believed that we would actually meet the 1st of July 2020 date, but uh, I'm making no guarantees to anyone. I've been involved in talking about the reform or reenactment of Division 7A since 2012. Um, and I've got a lot more grey hair now than I had when I started, and we've had exactly zero impact on those rules. So Division 7A um, is, is about loans coming out of private companies to shareholders or associates of shareholders, and those loans effectively being treated as distributions of profits. They're very complex provisions for a very simple issue. Um, the proposals were designed to uh, which were made for the, for the reform were designed to make them make those provisions fairer, easier to comply with, and so forth. Uh, they've been haven't been enacted. Haven't there's been almost no um, serious contemplation of reform of this area, which is very disappointing for someone who's been involved in that process. And the ATO seem to be taking some fairly strong positions on things. Some might say unreasonable. I think that was me who said unreasonable. Um, we're seeing a bit more of that. Uh, it, it is a it is a clearly a target for the tax for tax office audit activity because the provisions are finicky and tricky and easy to trip over, and the tax office takes full advantage of that. And I guess the biggest issue amongst those deferral rules is is those quarantine loans. Yes. So at the moment, loans which existed uh, in private companies from before the 4th of December 1997 are currently outside the operation of Division 7A. One of the consistent proposals through all of those, uh, all, all, all of the last seven years that I've been involved is to bring those pre 4th of December 97 loans into the system. So I would expect that that will eventually happen, whether from the 1st of July 2020 or when I'm not, I can't give any guarantees. But the planning point there is there need to be discussions had about if those loans had to be repaid, which eventually they will, um, how is that going to happen? Where, where is that funding coming from? So planning should start now in terms of how you would deal with those on the presumption that that legislation comes through and those loans have to be dealt with through dividends or I think other that, means. I think that's a very fair assumption to make and, and it would be very prudent to, to be doing that. So we turn our attention now to land tax and, and some local issues. Palaszczuk government brought in some, some changes in the last budget. Yes, so probably two, two things of note. Um, there was an increase of a quarter of a, of a percent in the land tax rate for land holdings, um, for the land holders who have more than $5 million of taxable value in their land in Queensland. So that quarter of a percent increase was on top of a 0.75, uh, sorry, a half a percent increase in the previous budget. So the land tax rate's gone up by 0.75% over the last two years in Queensland, just, just generally. So the, the top rate of land tax is now 2.75% in Queensland. Um, and then for foreign holders of land, there is a surcharge, a land tax surcharge 
Now, the, in the recent budget, that was the surcharge was increased to two percent from one and a half percent. So, in effect, giving a, a full up rate for land holdings of five million dollars, a four point seven five percent. Um, but then, well, yes, ouch. But previously, prior to this budget, um, the foreign land tax surcharge only applied to foreign individuals. It's now been extended to foreign companies and trusts. And so there probably were a number of foreign individuals who were affected by that land tax increase, but there are a significantly larger number of foreign companies and trusts that are now subject to that foreign land tax surcharge. So if you're thinking about a foreign pension fund, for example, that might own land in Queensland as part of its investment portfolio, its land tax rate suddenly went from 2.5% to 4.75% overnight. Now that's a, that's a significant amount. Um, the issue may very well be, or where that will affect domestic even um, people, is that unpaid land tax, of course, is dealt with every time, well, every time that a property is sold. And so if somebody has an unpaid land tax obligation that they're not aware of, and that becomes an issue at the time of settlement, that has the uh, potential to crash settlements. And so um, I think vendors uh, and purchases of land in Queensland want to be making sure that they're taking into account the risk of unpaid land tax as part of the risks that you contemplate when you're undertaking a sale transaction. So it could stall settlements? Could easily stall settlements, yes. And it sounds a bit like a, a revenue raise from uh, from a group of people who, a small number of people who don't vote. Don't vote. Um, yes, and there, but, but there is also a question about whether that foreign land tax surcharge can be passed through to tenants. Because the, discussion. the another discussion entirely. Uh, land tax is now in Queensland one of the um, outgoings that can be passed to tenants generally. Um, there's a serious discussion going on about uh, whether that foreign land tax surcharge can be passed on to tenants because you're effectively almost doubling the rate of the outgoing that can be passed on if it can. So turning our attention to the coming year and, and planning tips for 2020. Look, I think um, I've probably got thousands, but I thought I'd, I'd try and bring it down to two that I really think uh, require thought. The first is around dividend planning and, and profit profit distributions. Um, so planning planning your dividends because of the changes in the franking rate that will happen for companies with a turnover of less than $50 million. And indeed, if the government somehow manages to pass changes to the general corporate tax rate, if there are those changes, then how that will affect future planning of future dividends on franking credits and so forth. So I think profit repatriation to shareholders is a really important uh, discussion to be having this year and preferably now. Uh, if you leave it until the second half of June 2020, you're probably not giving yourself a lot of time and you're not giving yourself any time to discuss with your shareholders the fact that we're going to pay you a bigger dividend this year, uh, which means you might pay more tax. But the reason for that is if we pay it to you next year, you'll pay even more tax again because the franking credits will reduce. It needs a lot of thought and, and analysis, doesn't it? It needs a lot of thought and a lot of discussion. Now is the time to start that. And at the risk of... Repeating yourself, compliance, compliance, compliance. Yes, absolutely. So uh, th there is just so much focus and so many of our um, not so pleasant interactions with the tax office are starting from simple failures of compliance. Everything from not lodging documents on time, which can have impacts for uh, things like GST, direct to penalty notices, superannuation guarantee, penalties, especially for um, significant global entities, um, but also new rules that start from the 1st of July this year, not just in relation to GST, in relation to GST and super guarantee, but also in relation to pay as you go withholding. So it's not going to be an issue quite yet, but if you fail to report, that is lodge your business activity statement or instalment activity statement on time, you're denied a deduction for the wages that are reported on that and the PAYG withholding that's reported on that BAS until you get the BAS lodged. So in other words, once we get to 30 June 2020, and we're starting to think about well, what is the tax payable by the, by the entity this year. If you've got 
business activity or instalment activity statements outstanding past their due date where you have reported wages and reported pay as you go withholding, um, you'll be denied a deduction for, for the full amount of the payroll for the payroll which is on that business activity statement or instalment activity statement. Now for some business and some industries that are heavily employee re reliant, that is a huge number. Um, now you can, you can get the deduction back, so you get the deduction back by subsequently lodging the outstanding statement, but as soon as the tax office has written you a letter saying, hi, we're starting an investigation into your affairs, you lose that ability too. So then it becomes permanently lost. So the deduction for the payroll will become permanently lost at the point where the tax office says, hi, we've noticed you haven't lodged a few bases, therefore we're going to come out and have a chat to you. So there is every reason to make sure that compliance is tickety-boo. Going a little bit deeper into that, things like the payroll, the superannuation coding in your payroll system is something that probably nobody pays any real heed to. But reviewing that on an annual basis is becoming more and more important. Um, we've just had recently um, this, uh, the tax office uh, it would be, I guess, reconfirmed its position on the applicability of superannuation guarantee to leave loading, um, where basically the tax office said, yes, superannuation guarantee generally apply to leave loading, except in certain circumstances. I think a lot of payroll systems had been set up um, where leave loading was not subject to superannuation guarantee. And suddenly we're having a lot of people who are coming back and going, well, I've got the last however many years of not paying superannuation on, on leave loading. And you think, well, you know, that only applies when employees take, take leave and therefore it can't be that many. Uh, but let me tell you, once you start analysing that per employee across the last nine or 10 years, that's 40, 40 statements you've got to lodge, 40, 40 periods you've got to analyse. Uh, that's that's a lot of work to get that right again. So just reviewing those simple things, reviewing those numbers that just pop out of the system, well, we need to be questioning why they're just popping out of the system. Probably the other thing with compliance is it's becoming harder. There are more things that have to be lodged in more ways. Now the promise in the year 2000 was that business would have to communicate with the tax office either once a month or once a quarter on a combined business activity statement or instalment activity statement. So, um, it, and therefore they would only have to interact with the tax office, you know, in that one way potentially. That's no longer the case. 19 years later, um, we're in a position where uh, the uh, the tax have, you have to communicate with the tax office more often, and so therefore making sure that your compliance obligations are being met is getting harder, and so. People um, in charge of the finance function need to be on top of that. Need to be on top of what all their obligations are. Okay. Um, so I guess the the ATO's increased data matching capability is their is their new superpower in many ways. Because previously uh, someone would finish year end, we might get their books, we might find some things that need a rectification. The ATO we're never going to pick it up in, for at least for 12 months or something. We get things in order, but now. Is an immediacy of their data, which which really puts pressure on on taxpayers to be completely up to date, completely accurate, all the time. Absolutely, and and we're seeing that we're seeing uh, situations where the client is being contacted about things that are outstanding before we even really know that they're outstanding. the The system is almost real time, and that is putting pressure uh, on our clients' finance teams. Well, thanks, Mark. We we've, we've covered the ground. Um, we haven't received any questions um, from our attendees, but I guess looking forward, um, presumably we'll return to the budget timing that we've, we all know and love, which is May or usually it's around your birthday, as I, as I recall, or uh, unless there's an economic downturn, we have a mini budget. This will be the landscape for the for until May of next year. That's right. Um, I, I don't. I, I doubt that we'll see a mini budget unless we have a global financial crisis mark two. Um, so we'll be looking for May next year for further announcements and so forth. The government, as I said at the beginning, has a lot of work to do just with their announced but unenacted measures. Um, I'm, 
Uh, I'm trying to put pressure on the government. I'd like other people to, put, to help um, to say exactly what they're going to do with those measures because there are plenty out there that, as I say, in theory have already commenced where we don't have legislation. And that's unacceptable. That does not lead to certainty for business. Well, thank you. Um, so if something happens or if there's some significant change, we'll come back. And if there's a big lump of these pieces of legislation uh, coming through, we'll keep our clients updated through the usual channels. But thank you everyone for attending uh, today. And thank you, Mark, for your, your time and your words of wisdom. And we'll reconvene at some future point. You're most welcome. Thanks, Tony. Thank you all.